1994, thanks to my friend Bob Belden, I got an assignment from Mosaic Records to write the booklet for the boxed set Maynard Ferguson, The Roulette Recordings. Those were the exact recordings that I listened to when I was an early teenager, young trumpeter, getting into jazz. Maynard was the man. Uh, I've always loved his playing. Got a chance to interview him a number of years later. But back then, I guess this was about 94, when that recording was coming out, uh, they were producing the box set, and I got that assignment. I was really excited. And uh, I, tr I tried to reach out to Maynard, and no response. And uh, someone said to call his wife. I called Flo. No response. I said, you know what? Uh, this is some of his greatest music. Why doesn't he want to say anything about it? Then uh, someone else said to me, well, you know, Roulette Records was owned by Morris Levy. Put these on, because when these came out, this thing, right, this roulette record, all right, collection, right? So I put those on, and Maynard, you know, every time he would hear a certain tune that would remind him of something, he was saying, oh, yeah, I remember, uh, you know, we did this, and uh, 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 but listen to Ronnie Cuba here. Yeah, he was really great, you know, and he would make these great comments. So I put this on, and as soon as I put it on, he went, where'd you get that? I said, well, here, this is collection, and I showed it to him. This is the box, I showed it to him. And he went, ah, right? screwed three times. That's all he said. And the, Whoa, what do you mean? Screw three times. He goes, see these? Roulette? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is what he said. He goes, Roulette was owned by uh, Mars Levy. Mars Levy owned Birdland, a couple jazz clubs, was in charge of all the hat check rooms, was in charge of all the cigarette vending machines, and he was like mob related. He was like the, the entertainment arm of the overall mob. And, uh, you know, he took something from everything. And if you had to play New York, and if you were a jazz musician, you had to play New York, otherwise you couldn't get, you couldn't get yourself established. Uh, you had to play ball with Morris Levy. You had to sign to his label, which was roulette. You, uh, and, and you had to play ball. You had to do whatever he said. So, uh, and, and Maynard was one of those guys. So when you see the Count Basie roulette records, when you see Maynard roulette, all those roulette records, get a load of this. So... I said, well, what do you mean ripped off for the third time? He goes, well, I remember when we did those recordings. You'd do an LP for Morris, and he would say, okay, uh, that cost $70,000. Yeah, he's pulling some number out. You know, you don't see the books. He says, you don't know where he's getting this number, but he tells you that cost $70,000. So he says, Morris says, I need to make that back before you see anything because I have to get my expenses back before we start seeing what a profit is. So, Maynard, you know, the artists don't know. They're out there gigging. They don't know what the numbers are. So, um... The, the record's not going to make that kind of money back, you know, not unless you get a really big, big, big hit. Uh, so what happens is after a while, the record's not selling as much. You know, you get a bump when the record gets released and it starts to, you know, die away in terms of sales. But uh, so Mars comes back and he says, hey, you know, we need to pay that off. So let's do another record. Maybe you'll get a hit. So boom, it costs another 70 grand. Well, now you're in into them for 140 grand. So, you know, you're making all these records and you're never seeing anything. There's a good chance you won't see anything. So Maynard said he made like five or six records on roulette. Never saw any money because the more you make, the more in debt you get and the further behind you get. And, you, you know, you don't, you don't even know if the numbers are right that he's giving you. But everybody went through that. And you had to play ball with him. Otherwise, you could not play New York. This guy ran everything. It was, it was, it was a corrupt thing. There's a book called Hitmen. If anyone is interested in reading about the history of the record business, whoof. <laughs> so um, don't get the the art of the music that you love mixed up with the business. They're not, you know, there's two different animals and uh, they kind of coexist. Uh, so, and that always changes. That's a whole thing. But Morris Levy factors in big in the, the record business, especially in New York, especially with all the artists. And it wasn't just jazz, you know, it was... Uh, everybody who was recording uh almost and he was he was had his hands in everything uh so what happens is this there's like five records that maynard never saw any money for well mars levy at some point i think passes away all the property gets somebody buys it so now let's say somebody joe 
Bajan Nagol buys all their stuff. All right, so now it's his. He doesn't know anything about Maynard, that Maynard didn't get paid. All of a sudden, somebody else has it, and you know Maynard is even further from ever seeing any money because now it was bought cleanly from, I hopefully it was bought cleanly, but it doesn't matter. Once somebody buys it, then Maynard's kind of cut out of it. Well, then Maynard, I guess this stuff just sits around forever, and uh, uh, then Mosaic picks it up, which is a great label. They put out a lot of great... Uh, like anthologies, they go into the vaults and they find like some great recordings that have just been sitting there. A lot of great information. I mean, all these are great, all of them. I, have, I must have about 30 of these. They're just fantastic. But then they get it, and then they sell it, and it finally comes out. So that's why Maynard said three times that it was screwed, because when Mosaic puts it out, Maynard didn't see anything. When Morris Levy put it out, Maynard didn't see anything. And the guy in the middle held on to it. Maynard didn't see anything, so he said, yeah, but that's the way it had to be. You know, it wasn't anybody's, it wasn't the fault of Mosaic, this is how the business ran. But when it was funny, I put that up and he goes, man, screw three times. Lars Levy, another Jewish guy who was extremely influential in the music industry back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. As a matter of fact, his reach was so extensive that Variety magazine called him the octopus because his reach you know, in accordance with the, the role that he played, he wasn't, you know, one of the major labels. He had his own label, Roulette Records, but his reach in the industry was so extensive, they called him the octopus. And again, I got to say, another Jewish guy, Mars was Jewish, obviously, and just like Maya Lansky and Arnold Rothstein and Bugsy Siegel, he played a huge role in, uh, in organized crime in the mob in La Cosa Nostra here in America. And uh, we, we had a great relationship with a lot of Jewish guys. They were very smart, and they were gangsters at heart, no question about it. And, uh, and Morris Levy happened to be one of them. So he had a record label called Roulette Records, and uh, he was mobbed up. You know, he, was, uh, he had an association with a guy by the name of Tommy Eberly, who was at one time the um, uh, boss of the Genovese family. He later got involved with the Chin, was very close to him. He had a lot of dealings with uh, Tommy Vestola, Corky, they called him. He was a soldier, later a couple with the Di Cavalcante family. Uh, these were all influential guys, and Morris Levy was, was uh, hooked up with all of them. My father had some involvement with him. Very influential guy. But anyway, he had a record label called Roulette Records, and he had a couple of different things that he would do, um, you know, a couple of different scams that he pulled that netted him you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. He was really, really a heavyweight. He also had a chain of stores called Strawberry Records that he owned. I believe there were 60, 70, maybe 80 stores at that time. And a couple of scams that he was able to pull off quite successfully with the help of his organized crime connections. You know, one major one that he pulled off, um, I'll never forget, you know, and I'd learned about this, you know, from my dad and from my involvement in the record business, uh, which wasn't any, nearly as extensive as his. But uh, he would have a scam where uh, he would um, pirate the masters of some major artists. He would pirate the masters, he would duplicate these masters, and he would fill the um, retail stores with them at a lower price than the record labels. The big labels would sell them to the stores. So these records were selling extensively. They were his records, he was getting the revenue, the major labels were getting nothing, and the artists were getting beat out of their royalties. Now the artists, okay, of course, would go into the stores and they'd see these records flying off the shelves and they would go back to the labels and say, hey, you know, we see these stores stacked with our records and yet we're not getting the royalties, what's going on? So the big labels, they do their investigation, they find out that there's counterfeit records going into the stores at a cheaper price, so who do they call? They call Morris Levy. They say, Morris, we got this problem. These record companies, uh, you know, they're, they're selling counterfeit records. Our artists are not getting the royalties and we're getting beat out of the revenue. Can you help us? And Morris would say, of course, I can help you. It's gonna cost you X amount of dollars. He would charge them hundreds of thousands of dollars to put a stop to those counterfeit records going into those stores. And who did he put a stop on? Himself, because he was the one that was doing it. So he would stop them and uh, he would actually then start doing again with another label in another company. He formed like a daisy chain of companies to continue to pull this scam on the major record labels. And I'm talking about this is big money. This is huge money. So he pulled that quite successfully for quite some time. 
And of course, who was going to mess with him? They all knew his organized crime involvement. Nobody would mess with him. It was, be it was better for the record companies to pay him, and they did, the major labels. In the news at midday, a prominent New England businessman and record company executive today is denying charges that he teamed up with a reported mobster in an extortion plot. 59-year-old Morris Levy is named in three counts of a 117-count federal indictment. He's accused of two counts of extortion and one count of conspiracy to commit extortion in connection with the alleged being of a record distributor. Morris Levy was arrested yesterday at the Ritz-Carlton in Boston. Federal officials say he's the godfather of the American in music industry. Levy is the president of the successful Strawberries record store chain here in New England. He's also the founder of the Ro Roulette Records. Federal officials allege Levy uses his ties to organized crime to control the record industry. They say they were led to Levy following this man, Gaetano Corky Vestola, a reputed organized crime boss. Five federal grand juries are investigating allegations of mafia involvement in the music business. And Tuesday, a grand jury in Newark, New Jersey, returned a 117 count on indictment against 21 people, including Morris Levy, a powerful figure in the music business who owns record companies and record stores. Mr. Levy joins us this morning from Boston, where just 24 hours ago, he was arrested by the FBI. Good morning, Mr. Levy. Good morning, Mr. Ross. Mr. Levy, federal authorities were describing you yesterday as the godfather of the American music business, the connection between the mob and the music business. What do you say to that? There is no connection between the mob and the music business. At all? I don't believe so. You were indicted yesterday on three of the 117 counts. The indictment says essentially that you and a New Jersey mafia figure, Corky Vastola, uh, arranged to have somebody beat up because they owed more than a million dollars to the big record company MCA. What about these charges? They're not true. They wouldn't have been filed yesterday if I had joined the witness protection program. Well, what do you mean by that now? Well, the story from the beginning about two months ago, my controller, who's worked for me for 30 years, a very mild, meek person, was grabbed in the streets of New York when he left work and taken to the Essex House Hotel by an FBI agent and a policeman, held there for four hours, told he was going to get killed and he must turn into the um, witness protection program. Mr. Levy, were you also told by the FBI that you were going to be killed by the mob? Yes. And did they ask you to join the witness protection program? Yes. What did, did you say? I said I, I wouldn't join the witness protection program. Why not? Two reasons. One is I don't, I don't believe in the entire thing as being constitutional. And the other one is there's nothing I could tell them about a mob. And the third is I don't, uh, um, there's nothing I could do. I wouldn't, I just wouldn't join. I don't believe it's right. I don't believe that, uh, uh, people should be paid to testify and, and, and given the, I don't believe in the whole program. I don't think it's constitutional. Mr. Levy, what about the charges that were named in the indictment yesterday? They're ludicrous. Uh, actually, if I joined the program, there would have been no charges. The three charges, from what I understand, I haven't seen the indictment, is one that I charge usurious interest rates, which is a complete lie. They say you charge. loan money out at rates of about 104 percent That is a complete a lie. That is a complete lie, and I've never loaned anybody any money at any rates near that and as a matter of fact, if I lend money to friends and people, I don't even charge interest. Mr. Levy, let me ask you this. Uh, the indictment says essentially that you were involved in trying to collect about a million dollars for MCA records, that you and a New Jersey mafia figure by the name of Corky Vastola were doing that together and had someone beat up. That's distorted and not true. Was someone beat uh, up, do you know? I heard he was, but I haven't seen it. Were you responsible in any way for that? No, sir. Why were you collecting the money on behalf of MCA? What was your I wasn't deal? Collecting. That's not true either. We, he, uh, the party that supposedly got owed me a million dollars owed a company a million. We sold them the records, and he owed us a million dollars, and he wasn't paying. And I honestly believe that he wasn't paying because the witness protection program told him not to pay so that possibly somebody could say something wrong to him or threaten him on the phone and they could entrap somebody. Mr. That's what I honestly believe. Mr. Levy, is there mob involvement in the music business? You know Corky Vastola, don't you? I know him for 40 years. He's a described as a mafia boss with the DeCalvacanti Mafia family in New Jersey. Why do, you, why do you associate with people like that? 
I, I, I haven't uh, seen too much of him in the last 20, 25 years, but I, I associate with people I know, that I've known for a long time, and I don't believe I was indicted for knowing Corky Vestola. I think the three charges against me are the charges that we have to face, and one is usury, one is trying to collect money that's owed to me. They say that he got beat up, but I'm not involved in that at all. And the other one is conspiracy to do these things. The charges are ludicrous. If I joined the witness protection program, there would have been no charges. Mr. Levy, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank I take you. it you're going to enter a plea of not guilty to all this? Abs absolutely, sir. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Sir. Ross. Thank you. Thank you.